hosts today on the Sunflower Conversations are me, I'm Chantal, and I am joined by my colleague Lynn, who manages the Hidden Disability Sunflower in the US. Hi, Lynn, how are you? Hi there, I'm very good. Thanks, Chantal. It's lovely to see you and to hear you. It's really nice. I really enjoy doing a bit of co-hosting. Um, it's a great opportunity to catch up with with you and other colleagues and um, it adds a nice dimension to these conversations that we have with our lovely guests. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to do this today and I'm especially interested in today's um, guest uh, to hear about everything she's gone through. Okay, so let's find out what are we going to be discussing. So we're going to be discussing rare diseases, focusing on the pituitary disease called Cushing's. Our guest is Gretchen Jordan, and she's joining us from Minneapolis. Gretchen was diagnosed with Cushing's in 2020. Now, Gretchen is a very busy lady. She's a patient advocate for pituitary health and the associate director of Cushing Support and Research Foundation. So that's quite a lot of words, I feel like I've just said. Um, and so first of all, welcome, Gretchen. Welcome to the Sunflower Conversations. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and it is a privilege to be sharing my story for Sunflower and appreciate that opportunity. So, yeah, thank you for having me. Well, I think I guess the the key thing that I've said in the introduction is that it's a rare disease. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to have a space to talk about rare diseases and help raise awareness and cognizance of, of what they are and, and how they impact people. So first of all, can you explain what the pituitary gland is and what role it plays in our body? Sure. Um, yeah, the pituitary gland is a small pea-sized gland that's positioned at the base of your brain, and it sits in a little chamber behind your eyes. Uh, and it's considered the master gland of your body's endocrine system. So it makes hormones and also tells other endocrine glands to release other hormones. So hormones can carry messages throughout the body through blood to our organs and skin, muscles, things like that, uh, a bunch of other tissues. And these messages tell your body what to do and when to do it. So you might ask, well, what's the endocrine system? <laughs> it's a large thing, right? Uh, without getting into too much biology, the endocrine system as a whole is made up of these organs, glands, and tissues that are in charge of creating the hormones and maintain countless body functions, as well as continuously like monitoring those functions. Uh, so you can have more than 50 different hormones that impact nearly every aspect of our health. And some examples okay, be ready for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Metabolism, growth, balance of your blood sugar and blood pressure, fluids and electrolytes, body temperature. Uh, it impacts your digestive system, your nervous system, immune system, cardiovascular system and heart, respiratory system, the reproductive system, even the placenta when the woman is pregnant. Uh, it impacts your mood, your circadian rhythm, which is your sleep-wake cycle. Uh, your liver and pancreas, your cognitive de cognitive development and memory formation, your bone and muscle health, your skin, hair, nails, your response to stress and adrenaline and suppressing inflammation. So the endocrine system is pretty vital to our existence and certainly impacts, you know, that, that master gland or pituitary and, and impacts to that can be life-threatening. But, uh, you know, some people's condition require the removal of the pituitary gland, which you can live without it, but you must then take medication to replace the pituitary hormones that you're missing that maintain all those functions. So it's basically that's everything. Yeah, it? yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> um, when I think about hormones, I think, oh, with testosterone, um, estrogen, uh, progesterone, and I don't really think of too much more. Now, I do want to ask you something about cortisol. Is cortisol a hormone? Uh, it is, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So what does it do? Cortisol is commonly known as the fight or flight hormone. You might have heard that in the past. Uh, it is a steroid type of a hormone, but it does much more than just regulate stress. 
the pituitary gland would send a message to your adrenal glands and the adrenal glands are the little lobes that sit on top of your kidneys and the adrenals then produce the cortisol. Uh, so cortisol is an essential hormone that impacts, you know, many things, all those systems that I talked about, the organs and tissues, um, your body continuously monitors the levels of cortisol and having too much or too little can be a bad thing. Uh, when the body has too little cortisol, the pituitary then sends out that signal for the body to produce more or produce less if there's an excess. Uh, but it is essential to life to have some cortisol. Yeah. I just thought of another hormone, <clears throat> which is really terrible of me to have forgotten it because it's something I have, which is underactive thyroid. So sure. thyroid is a hormone, isn't it? Uh, the thyroid is a gland, but it's a gland. It does control uh, a few hormones. So, few, yeah. Okay, right. See, I mean, I don't even understand about my, my own workings of my own, my own body. <laughs> I mean, you, you sound so, so knowledgeable. Have you learned all of this since having a diagnosis yourself? Or were you already quite uh, uh, scientifically I... minded? I had never heard of Cushing's. I, I knew of the pituitary gland just from high school biology class, but I had no idea, you know, what, what really, truly the body does and what it's made up of. Um, so even when I was diagnosed with Cushing's, I, I had such little time to kind of process that. And I was just taken into treatment pretty quickly. And, um, it wasn't until really I started recovery and feeling better that I had the energy to really kind of dive in and learn more about it. And that's when I just uncovered a myriad of, of things and challenges and, and had a better expectation of what my life might be. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, joining the foundation and volunteering more, getting to talk to other patients and hearing what their stories are really made a difference. And you hear the impact to every individual's life that, you know, that happens and they all have their unique story, even though there's maybe a common foundation, but everybody really, really has their own, their own path. You are listening to the Sunflower Conversations with Chantal. To learn more about the Sunflower, visit our website. Details are in the show notes. So you got your diagnosis in 2020, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so that's not really that long ago. So let's find out what is Cushing's for a start and then what led you to, you know, to get a diagnosis, what symptoms were you experiencing? Yeah, uh, Cushing's syndrome is a disorder with both physical and mental changes that result when the body has too much cortisol for a long period of time. Uh, so this can result from the body making too much cortisol or from taking medicines called glucocorticoids or steroids which affect the body the same way as cortisol. Uh, so a person, a person might get prescribed a steroid medication to treat things such as rashes or asthma, arthritis, inflammatory disease, allergies, uh, you know, also used to prevent organ rejection and transplant recipients. So the steroids really help ease inflammation. Uh, but most of the time, if you're prescribed a steroid for allergies or like a temporary rash, you don't take it for a long period of time. Uh, so it, it, it is a benefit. Um, there are two types of Cushing syndrome, and then there's also Cushing's disease. Uh, Cushing syndrome can be exogenous or caused by factors outside the body, like taking the steroids for too long and can be treated by the patient just stopping the steroid. Okay. And what's this extra, what's that word? Extra nugus. Exogenous. Ex yeah. Ex it's real wild. <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, so that means that um, an external source is, is causing see. the disease. Okay. Yep, it's a it's not your body doing something. So then the opposite then is endogenous, which is caused by factors within the body uh, where the adrenals are releasing too much cortisol. Uh, so it's usually that tumor that's taken over and directing that hormone. Uh, then there's Cushing's disease which is a form of Cushing syndrome and a bit more rare. Uh, it's caused by a tumor on the pituitary gland, which then causes the gland to produce the hormone that's called ACTH. And that hormone then signals the adrenal glands to release too much cortisol. Um, Cushing's disease only affects about 10 to 15 people per million every year. Uh, it is more common in women uh, and occurs most often between 
uh, or in people between the ages of 20 and 50. Right. Uh, so I would, I was diagnosed with it at 43. Um, and according to the endocrine society, I, I looked this up quick, a large study that was finished in 2021, uh, found that patients with the disease had a threefold increase in death, uh, mostly due to cardiovascular disease and infection. Uh, but death rates have fallen since 2000, but you know, it's still unacceptable, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, but life expectancy can improve if Cushing's is treated and that the patient goes into remission. So, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but you know, what we really need to work for is quicker diagnosis so that the patient can get treated and, and help them. So what, what symptoms were you experiencing that led you to go to the doctors? Similar to others that I've talked with, um, because it's a rare disease, it's harder to diagnose and it's also harder than other rare diseases because it's non, it has nonspecific symptoms. Uh, so even though there are many of them, uh, the more common symptoms start with abdominal weight gain, you know, despite weight loss and exercise efforts. Um, you've got loss of concentration, a round red face, a fat hump on the back of your neck, uh, oh. high blood pressure and diabetes. But that describes most people, right? <laughs> Especially when you're getting to uh, like our midlife where your body shape changes anyway and other things are occurring in the body, um, yeah. that's not necessarily what you jump to, is it? Oh, I might have Cushing's. No, you just think, well, is this what over 40 is like? And, yes. you know, as a woman and we go through all these changes. So, um, yeah, my path to diagnosis started in about 2015 or 16. It's when I think back to when some of those noticeable symptoms started to become apparent. Um, my husband and I began a plant-based diet at home around then, and he was feeling great, you know, but I didn't feel much of a change. Mm -hmm. uh, but I kept up with it knowing I was eating healthier and I was, you know, somewhere I was getting a benefit out of it, even if I didn't really feel different. Um, and I've always been kind of up and down in my weight. So gaining weight wasn't too alarming to me. Um, I had a lot of pain in my knee, and leg and you know joint pain can be part of this, but turns out I had hip dysplasia and had a full hip replacement in 2017. That's how I spent my 40th birthday. Oh, um, but that aside, you know that alleviated a lot of that pain, and I felt much better in general after that healed. So then a couple of years later, in 2018 and 2019, the other symptoms started becoming more noticeable, like my hair was thinning and I was growing facial hair. And, you know, as again, as a woman over 40, I just figured that's part of life. And mm -hmm. I gained more weight and my job responsibilities changed in a way that I couldn't really keep up, which wasn't my character. Um, it was an odd feeling for me. Uh, I just felt different and I couldn't remember new information. I couldn't remember my client's contract details. I couldn't even focus enough during the day to accomplish you know, the tasks that I wanted to. And I almost eight hours would go by. And I was like, what did I do today? You know, I just felt so scattered. Uh, it felt like I was spinning wheels and I was easily, uh, easily agitated and yeah. my thoughts were all over the place. Um, and I began not really able to sleep at night. Uh, at first I thought, this is great. I can stream TV until 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Start and, you know, start work at eight and get through the day. Um, but yeah. a couple of days in a row like that, then I would sleep pretty well just from being exhausted. And, and then the cycle would start over again. So I would also, you know, sweat through my clothes at night when I could sleep. Um, so a lot of changes that happened. And I also, you know, another point of this was <clears throat> I worked from home and my husband did too at the time, uh, especially during COVID, right? Um, mm -hmm. During the day, he would come into my office and he would comment on how like just angry and red in the face I looked all the time. I didn't necessarily feel angry. Um, and we had been fostering senior age dogs. And of course, that means they typically have ailments like seizures or bladder issues and things like that, which took extra time and care on my part. And I noticed I was becoming ultra focused on them and just overly concerned and I was sort of feeling everything to the extremes emotionally. Yeah. And it was just exhausting and just wasn't feeling like 
more, you know, more nonchalant, I guess. But, and then these feelings just continue to get more excessive. And I thought it was my job and was getting too stressful. And I traveled a lot and I talked to my husband about it and we agreed the, you know, the best thing for me would be to quit my job, that my health and happiness was more important than a paycheck. So I quit my career in 2020 of June and uh, I felt lucky to have that opportunity to do so, you know, make that decision. Um, so I focused my energy on two rental properties and houses that we have. And I spent time fixing up one of them during that summer, like renovating the kitchen and new floor cabinets and trim and painting and patching drywall and such. But with the exception of having a friend help me a few times, I did everything myself because it's COVID. And so not a lot of people oh, were around. Uh, but then during that time, I noticed even more symptoms started popping up more on that physical side where I had extreme weakness after doing work, you know, only for a short time. And I'd have to take a lot of breaks. And it was like, I would feel lightheaded and have to sit down a lot. And then I would do some work and my hands would start shaking. Um, I, the thing that sticks out the most was I need to measure something, you know, like maybe put up curtains or, or whatnot. And I would take the, read the tape measure and then turn around to write it down. And the numbers just vanish from my mind. Like, okay. I do this thing like so easy, just happened over and over. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. It was so Your frustrating. Memory was just yeah. completely obliterated. Yeah. So I'm thinking in the wild, animals get a boost of cortisol when they're either being attacked or about to attack. And I guess that's. I'm just sort of looking for an, an analogy here. And they are like, they're in wild mode, aren't they? I guess it's like, it's, it, there's no relaxation there. It's everything is um, pricked up, uh, every tingling sensation they're on high alert for because it's a life or death situation, potentially. And that's yeah. what you were experiencing every day. Yeah, yeah, all the time, every day. And, and you know, and it's a helpful thing when it's, when it's correct in your body, you know what it's, yeah, yeah. it's not the right dose, right? <laughs> so yeah. like we need that to help us through those situations, you know, or when, you know, the, that story of the baby getting trapped under the car and the mom mm. lifts the car up, you know, that extreme rush of adrenaline and, you know, that power that you have, but just for a short time, you know, and, you know, there's other systems in your body that actually shut down so that it can compensate and give you the boost in those other areas. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to feel that all the time, you know, I would get profuse sweating in the easiest of situations and uh, that was embarrassing. You're right. Um, yeah. the whole situation was just frustrating and, and I was kind of worried because I didn't know what was happening to me. And I thought this just can't be about getting older. Like this is ridiculous. <laughs> Probably something more. Yeah. So do you think the hip was also linked to it or was that something different? Uh, I originally thought it could have been, but because it was hip dysplasia, that was something that I was born with. And it just happened to come up uh, at the same time where, you know, the bone joints started rubbing together and causing the pain. So that was inevitable. Um, but there are people that do get bone and joint pain, um, you know, the osteoporosis and that inflammation and things like that. So there is a lot of that that does happen. Um, but then eventually after all this, I, I had my wellness check in July of 2020 and I prepared for that appointment by just writing down all of the symptoms and issues that I had, regardless of how small. And I think that's really important for people to really kind of own their own health in that way. Um, you know, you get to an appointment and you kind of tend to forget things that you wanted to talk about. So I thought that was helpful for me to do. And I would try to remember when each symptom started or it got worse that, that I wasn't so good with, but, you know, I told my general practitioner about the hair loss and the growing chin hair and the insomnia, feeling stressed all the time. Didn't really know how to put it into words, but I had known about cortisol from having thyroid issues in the past. Um, and so I told her I wanted to check that along with vitamin D and some other general blood work, but um, she diagnosed me on the spot with hirsutism, which is the male hair growth pattern in women. So the losing of the head hair, the growing of the chin hair and chest hair, Okay, uh, which I learned later was a symptom of Cushing's. Um, and then the cortisol results were extremely high. And so she wanted me to go see an endocrinologist. Uh, and then from there, 
I started getting more labs done and talking about any symptom that I had. And again, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but also had that buffalo hump that they call it or that fat bulge at the back of my neck and purple strii, which are marks on your stomach or stretch marks, um, right. pressure, you know, which I'd had for years, but I didn't correlate really anything. Um, yeah. he asked if I was diabetic, which I wasn't, but many Cushing's patients are, and it's hard to control diabetes when you have Cushing's. And that's another red flag that, that endocrinologists should watch out for when they have diabetic patients, you know, to see, is it hard to control, you know, just test that cortisol. Um, you know, he asked if I had menstrual issues or PCOS, that polycystic ovarian syndrome, which mm -hmm. is common among women, um, which I didn't, but those are other common symptoms in female patients and gynecologists should be aware that if they have patients with PCOS, that's again, hard to control. They just might have cortisol issues from, or, or you know, Cushing's themselves. So there's kind of that, a lot of people could be on alert or more aware of this yeah. disease, to try to catch it, you know, but I was lucky with the multiple testing that I had done. It came back with clear results and the next step was to order an MRI of the brain because of the Cushing's disease suspicion. Um, this will happen within a span of about three to four weeks. Um, and when I started reading about Cushing's for the first time, I started, you know, kind of getting concerned. But when the MRI came back and showed an eight millimeter tumor on my brain, I literally like did a fist pump. I was like, I was so happy that I had this diagnosis and right, so to just, some could explain, explanation. yeah, explain how awful I was feeling. So yeah. you know, I think many people of rare disease or any complicated disease feels that way a little bit, you know, because you have that path forward and that uncertainty just can drive you nuts. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, you know, I say I was lucky for many reasons and I understood my body and tracked these changes over time. And I was able to talk to my doctor about how I was feeling uh, many times, especially women will make up excuses for why they don't feel well mm -hmm. and ignore it or push through. Um, they tend to take care of others before themselves. Um, you know, also I'd been with my doctor for almost 20 years and she knew me. She was listening to me. Um, I know a lot of people that struggle with that. Uh, but then when seeing the endocrinologist, he was he was aware of Cushing's. He knew what it was. And I wasn't gaslighted with the talk of, well, just eat better and exercise more and come back in six months, you know, which is the path of many patients uh, or the ridiculous things I've heard patients go through, such as, well, you're black, black people don't get Cushing's or you don't look like the typical Cushing's patient. So it can't be Cushing's. And they're referring to the physical symptoms, which almost 30% of Cushing's patients don't even get that typical look and that extreme weight gain. And then right. that further delays the diagnosis, you know? Yeah. And that's why the average time to diagnosis is five to seven years. It wasn't until after the diagnosis and understanding of the disease that I could look back over the years and better understand why I visited an arthritis specialist, saw a mental health therapist, saw a chiropractor consistently, you know, was told to have a sleep study, uh, I tried naturopath doctors. I just can't figure out what was going on and why I felt that way. And so many patients see so many specialists on their path and just don't get that diagnosis that they need and all that time and money that's spent. Uh, but, you know, other common symptoms that people have are diabetes and brittle bones. In fact, one person I talked to cracked her collarbone while washing her hair in the shower. Ooh. You know, it's just, that's extreme, <laughs> Or the weight gain that gets excused as you're not trying hard enough. And another person ended up getting bariatric surgery or, you know, a stomach band exactly. because she couldn't lose the weight only to find out that when the weight didn't come off, the surgeon suspected Cushing's. Oh, so no. talk about your misdiagnosis. <laughs> oh, Lynn, what do you think about that? That's an extreme I don't know. I don't uh, know that way of doing treatment, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Um, I had a question for you. Does it always show up in the blood in the high cortisol? Like, is that a main indicator or does everyone have, um, a tumor on the pituitary gland? Cause how are these things missed and yeah. why would they not do that before they went for a stomach surgery or something, you know? I think you have the golden question that we ask so, <laughs> to our doctors so many oh. times. Um, the, there are actually people that have a pituitary tumor, but it's non-functioning. 
So it's, it doesn't actually produce hormones and it's just fine. You know, you can leave it as it is unless it starts impacting your vision or something, but, um, cortisol can be tested kind of first through, through the blood, a simple blood test that's done at 8 AM. Cause that's when your cortisol is peaking for the day. That's when you're trying to wake up, uh, typically. Um, but it's not really considered the gold standard. So that can be an indicator and lucky, I guess for me it was, but some people that when you've got that insomnia and your sleep cycle is messed up, you might not hit your high at that time of day, or, uh, you might have cyclical Cushing's, which is the same thing, but it actually comes and goes. And so you might not hit that lab result at the right time. Maybe it's, maybe you get it every couple of weeks or that type of thing, but there is a series of tests still pretty darn simple, um, to correlate with the blood draw. And that's taking urine tests or, uh, late night salivary testing, uh, through your saliva. Um, so it's really not invasive. Um, it's just more the awareness and, you know, trying to start with, you know, this, this person's just not getting better, you know, with what, with what you're trying to do and, testing cortisol, I think is become, it's going to become a lot more common, or at least people are going to be more aware of that, uh, because it can cause or be the cause of so many issues for people. So we're hoping to spread the word to, to get that just more of a common, you know, just like your cholesterol, just like your blood pressure, you know, test your cortisol if you're just not feeling it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That's good. That's a good takeaway. Yeah, that is great. Cause I think we're all going to be asking <laughs> that now. I know I will. Right. It's just yeah. one, one thing that, uh, you know, and I get how you could totally just think it's getting older and kind of go through that struggle where you're kind of misdiagnosed and people kind of, you know, kind of gaslight me a little bit, or you do it to yourself sometimes. Right. Yeah. So uh, what treatment did you receive and then how, how did that affect your symptoms? Yeah. Um, so two weeks after being diagnosed, uh, my treatment was to have surgery to remove the tumor on the pituitary at the base of my brain. Uh, other treatments can be radiation if the tumor is very small and the patient can't afford or they can afford a slower treatment because um, that takes a lot longer. Uh, or if the first surgery wasn't successful, they might have radiation. Uh, also, if the patient doesn't want to have surgery or the tumor is in a place that can't be removed for, you know, because it's right next to your optic nerve and your carotid artery. So, you know, That's if it's like a very you know, precarious yeah. position, yeah. very, yeah. very dangerous. And then there are also medications that can either block cortisol receptors in your body or lessen the amount of cortisol production, which is really helpful. Uh, those medications aren't hundred percent effective and they do come with side effects. So surgery is the primary treatment option uh, when people can do that. So again, for me, luckily the tumor wasn't impacting my vision. Um, and since it's, it is right by the optic nerve as well as the carotid artery, you know, I'll describe a little bit how it's done, but turn your volume down if you don't want to hear. <laughs> okay. Else, but, a little content warning, everyone. Yeah. It's just, um, but just the type of surgery performed is called mm. a transphenoidal procedure. So they go up actually through your nose and then drill a little bone to get back to that cavity where the pituitary is. And then they remove the tumor and then they can patch up that hole with uh, a synthetic material. So there's, there's no visible scar. And then typically after a successful surgery of removing the tumor, your cortisol actually drops almost instantly to nothing. So you have to be monitored very carefully because remember your body needs some cortisol to live, mm -hmm. but that tumor had taken over the cortisol production in my body. And so my pituitary then needs to kind of wake up and learn again how to properly function. Uh, and that can take months. Uh, so a doctor would do another brain MRI and check to, and check the cortisol blood level to ensure that everything is as low as it should be, you know, and the, there's no visible tumor left. Uh, but at times there can be an unsuccessful surgery and that cortisol doesn't drop low enough, which means the whole tumor wasn't removed. And then there could be some tumor cells left behind uh, and still cause that elevated cortisol. Um, then the options then would be a second surgery or radiation or medication. So I needed to be careful for, you know, other signs of like cranial fluid leaking out my nose and of course any other signs of infection. But as far as the change in the symptoms, it does take weeks for some symptoms to go away but mostly months to even a couple of years or more. So we're supposed to, what's supposed to happen is 
when you leave the hospital, you're given steroids for approximately six months, could be longer. Um, you might be thinking, well, wait, if having too much cortisol is the problem, then why are you given steroids in high yeah. doses? Yeah. Um, but the body is used to being so jacked up on steroids for so long and it's gotten used to that. And so when you start with a higher than normal level of steroids that your body needs, then you slowly taper down. And so then, then when it gets to the normal range, then your pituitary can wake up and start producing okay. the hormones that it needs to and tell the adrenals the proper amounts of cortisol that your body needs. Um, but yeah, by tapering down slowly over time, it makes it easier to tolerate. Um, has, your, then, has your pituitary gland started producing the cortisol on its own? It has. Yes. It I'm has. thankful that, that it, it started working again. You know, then after three months, I started to be able to walk better and felt a little bit more part of reality. Uh, I still couldn't, still couldn't walk upstairs without using a couple hands on the railing to help pull me up. And usually it took a couple hands to lift a glass of water because I was so weak. As far as my life goes, like, um, I guess what, what was strong to me is it, like with the foundation, we conducted a few quality of life surveys over the past five years or so. And the latest was done last fall. Um, so fall of 2023 and from Cushing's patients around the world, we learned that one in five serious relationships and marriages end because of Cushing's. So the disease has a huge impact on people's lives, but for me personally, I feel lucky in that I had the most supportive husband throughout the entire journey. He had patience during the mood changes and the weight gain and the stress before treatment. And again, so supportive during the months of that brutal recovery. Uh, and since I was diagnosed and, and had surgery in 2020, my support network was pretty slim, right? People just, people were in lockdown from yeah. the pandemic. Uh, but it was almost a blessing to have gone through the toughest parts during COVID lockdown because I couldn't go out with my friends for months, even if I wanted to. So yeah, you got missing out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my husband is an introvert, so he was perfectly happy being at home. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, he did the best that he knew how to take care of me and with the limited knowledge that we had, uh, of this disease. Um, uh, but I hear from most patients, including myself, you know, it's hard for friends and family to understand, you know, what you're going through. And my closest friends would stop by for short periods of time when I could get out of the chair or bed and we'd sit outside. Um, uh, so I was grateful for the support that I had, and I know many people don't, uh, but my relationship with my husband became closer and yes. my own perspective on life had changed. Um, you know, you find out what you really want to live for, whether it be a spouse, a child or a friend who's watching over us. We, we have those people that take care of us when we're sick. And then when struggling with a long, long-term disease that changes you physically and mentally, it takes a toll on everyone around you, you know, and they need support too, to get through this. So I asked my husband if, if he would write down some thoughts about his experience and perspective through all of this. And I, I just wanted to read you yes, what, please. what he yes. wrote. I'd love to hear what um, he said. It's, it's hard to see her going through this. I kn and knowing she's in agony and adjusting to a whole new way of life in terms of her abilities. And all I can do is support as best as I can but I can't make her pain go away. And that was worse around the time of surgery when her Cushing's was bad. The recovery was also really hard and dangerous even. Personally, it is also hard adjusting to life where coping with this and seeking care is now a major part of everyday life, uh, replacing life as it was when we were younger and healthier. So not what you think you'll be facing at 40, uh, but also knowing this is not temporary it will be our normal life now. And as long as life goes on, in fact, it will be probably never be better than it is right now. So wanting to try and get the most out of the time we have, but at the same time, having limited ability to do, to do that. And thankfully, recurrence is unlikely. And she is a superstar when it comes to managing her own care much better than I ever could. And all the help she has gotten, she's gotten first because of her own persistence and skills. And I'm afraid if she can't do it, will I be able to? Um, for example, I couldn't do that and hold down a job. I'm grateful that we most likely have a good road ahead of us, but I don't think Cushing's is ever over. I'm also really proud of how she is using this experience to try and help others. So that was really nice to hear. Yeah. Just, you know, I, I couldn't ask for more and I just wanted to give a shout out to the caregivers out there. Hopefully your husband um, enjoyed writing what he wrote 
having an opportunity to kind of have his voice heard and celebrate you at the same time it must be quite a nice um thing for you to read there it is it is it's it's been it's been lovely and and we haven't we also haven't had the stress of, of children you know that's that's a whole nother dynamic that people have so yeah as, as bad as it is I'm grateful at the same time <laughs> yeah I was just gonna say I'm just so impressed with all the advocacy you know groups you're doing and all the help that you're giving to people like this because you're a big part of somebody's journey that's just starting this or maybe doesn't know what this is and all the work you're doing is amazing and um you know even for caregivers, I'm sure just knowing that what's going on and hearing other people's story and um, the work you're doing is so helpful for others. So I thank you. It's great. Thanks. <laughs> what work does the Pituitary Health and Cushing Support and Research Foundation do? Um, and how can people reach out for support and information? There, there are some decent pituitary health and Cushing support resources around the world. Um, there's the World Alliance of Pituitary Organizations, or WAPO. Um, that's a global resource with member foundations in multiple countries, so they can help guide patients with pituitary diseases to support that they might find in their home country. Um, their website is wapo.org. And then the Cushing Support and Research Foundation, or CSRF, um, is the nonprofit that I work for. And we work to educate and support patients and caregivers, clinicians, and all the relevant stakeholders through all aspects of the Cushing syndrome and Cushing's disease journey. So we, we aim to be that collective voice for change that we need to see because the average diagnosis time just remains too long and treatment options are not easy or optimal the patients frequently suffer from, you know, the inadequate post-treatment care uh, and the mental health support. Um, and we can, you know, we can be found on social media like Facebook or Instagram, YouTube, but it's easiest to find our website uh, at csrf.net. Um, and patients can email us at any time. And we also host a global patient support Zoom call for which you can sign up on the website as well. Um, and then excitingly, Next year in 2025, we're planning to launch a Cushing's patient registry, which will be huge. It will gather the patient data, both clinically and that quality of life, you know, yeah. that, that I talked about, which then can be used for studies to improve that Cushing's patient time to diagnosis and better understanding of what happens beyond, you know, just that disease itself and the myriad of other things that get impacted. So It'll first launch in the US and then we plan to capture global patients as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, we will include those uh, website addresses in the show notes so people can um, click on those if they weren't quick enough to write down the um, the website addresses. So that's really useful. Thank you. So what do you think about the Hind Disability Sunflower? Oh, when I heard about the sunflower from another patient support organization in Ireland. I, I was so happy to see a resource out there for such a broad audience. Um, a patient with a disability already has so much to bear and go through. And this is a simple way to get support when you're out and about and not have to explain what you're going through. Um, it's such a relief when you have such a complicated story. <laughs> and uh, I saw the sunflower at my hometown airport customer service desk and even a huge billboard outside the airport here in Minneapolis. Um, and now that I have a daily injection medication, I need to ensure I have proper disposal containers, you know, the, the sharp containers. Um, I need places to sit or a quiet room just to remove all the stimulation from traveling. Um, others that have adrenal insufficiency, they might need help with refrigerated medications or more urgent needs that arise. Uh, but I know the recognition of sunflower will spread and I wanna help others know that that, that problem, program exists. And I think that's the great thing about the sunflower because it is there for everybody. Um, and so if we can use the sunflower to uh, raise the profile of rare diseases such as Cushing's and we are really delighted to be able to do that. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed um, talking with you, Gretchen. If you are interested in any of the advice discussed in this podcast, please follow up with your GP or healthcare practitioner. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it, leave a rating and review to help raise awareness of non-visible disabilities and the hidden disability sunflower. You can also follow and subscribe to the Sunflower Conversations podcast. Thank you.